good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here this evening um, for the first Ward 7 meeting at a, a school, at, at North Junior High School. So I'm glad to see everybody here, considering it's absolutely beautiful outside. And um, we have a suggestion to move the meeting outside, but I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I might lose a few of you, so um, thank you for being here again. It's, um, this is a Ward 7 meeting for some of you in the audience that haven't attended um, some of my past meetings. I have held them at, in previous um, times, I've held them at local uh, businesses. Uh, for example, the Fuller Craft Museum, some of um, local restaurants in Ward 7. So I wanted to highlight some of the businesses around, but this one I decided to have here at our school and I have to thank our Deputy Superintendent of Schools, Michael Thomas, for arranging this for us. So um, thank you, Michael Thomas, for hosting, uh, for allowing us to host our meeting here at North Junior High. He is a pleasure to work with and makes everything seem very easy, so I wanted just to give a shout out for that. Um, this evening we have a, a few things planned. We have a few people in the audience. Um, you know, we'll take some questions afterwards. I have a few presentations for you. and. Um, then you'll, we'll take some questions. If you have some questions that you don't want to ask yourselves, there are cards on your tables. You can write them down and we'll read them. And then the appropriate person that it's addressed to will answer your questions for you. Um, first off, it's today is the National Day of, Day of Prayer. So um, I would like to take just a moment of silence to observe that. Thank you. Um, uh, first off, we have a lot of things going on in Ward 7. Um, we don't have any new businesses, but we have a lot of things that are moving and happening with the Fuller Craft Museum, which we have somebody speaking to you about later on, and um, you know, DW Fields Park. We have a lot of things planned for this summer. So I hope you'll go on to the City of Brockton website and, uh, and uh, get some of, those, some of the information. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to have a little bit of an update first on the uh, state of our schools from our Ward 7 school committee person, which is Ray Henningsen. He'll fill you in on what's going on with our schools. So, Ray, if you want to come on up. Good evening. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, thank you, Councillor Asak. Um, just to give you a brief update, I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Uh, we're currently in our budget process. Um, right now, the school committee voted on a $172 million budget, and the mayor has proposed his budget, which is $163 million. So we have a little bit of ways to go before we get uh, bridge that $9 million gap, but we're working uh, day in and day out to, to, to bridge that gap. Um, we are working on um, various ways uh, to not make as many cuts as we have in the past. Some of the things that um, we cut last time around were middle school sports. We're working on a, on a hybrid model of that so we don't have um, middle school sports cut, but uh, modified in such a way that saves us in, in time um, and cost and busing and stuff like that. So uh, that's really where we are in terms of the school department budget. Um, we have, um, last week we had our, our Special Olympics games um, at the high school. It was very widely attended. Um, uh, there was um, a large contingent from all of our schools um, at, at the games. And um, this week coming up, in the next couple weeks, we have uh, a play at the school called Anything Goes. And I encourage everybody to come down and see it. It's a great play. Um, our kids are fantastic. It's the cheapest $12 that you'll ever spend in your entire life, it's, it's the best thing you'll ever see. It's like watching a, a play straight out of Broadway. Um, and we have some really, really talented kids. So I would, uh, it's May 15th, 16th, and 17th at the Brockton Height Theater. So if you're interested, look on the website. They have available tickets. You can contact many people uh, for those tickets and uh, we hope to see you there. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, sure. uh, I have. I walk from through uh, Walker's playground and through the school, 
to get to uh, the bus stop on Oak Street, which is on the other side, which is on this side. And I mean, I have a terrible time getting across there. And I sent, I don't, uh, Shirley, I don't know if she got them or not, I sent the pictures of that crossing sign that that ha that's, has a um, solar panel on the top, so it takes no electricity. And the city of Taunton has them all around, all the school areas, and that flashes, it's got eight little lights on it that's flashing all the time. And I mean, that'd be a lot cheaper than those stupid cones out there. They have them out there when the kids are crossing, but then they go put them off to the side somewhere. And I, I come home from the, I take the bus back from uh, Market Basket, and I uh, get off at North Junior High there. I got two bundles in each hand, and I'm standing out there a foot, foot and a half out on the roadway, and they won't stop. And one day, one of the long buses, wow, about 40 miles an hour, went right down Oak Street. He didn't care that I was standing there. I mean, it, you know, I think I'm going to get killed one of these days, you know, out there. And then the next thing is that back roadway going into the uh, loading dock area. The road's not wide enough for the buses to go back and forth on each side. So they've been driving on the grass path, which is now 18 inches deep. It's a rut that the buses ride in. And I mean, if they have to swerve for any reason or something, they can't. They're, they're stuck in that rut. I know you're not going to repave it, but fill it in with gravel so it's level. And then the next thing, as you continue down that road, there's all brush on the side next to the two houses on Mathlin Avenue. Now, last year, I don't know how many windows you had. More than a dozen windows smashed on that side. If you cut that brush out, those people could see, and even if they're not looking, the people that are going to be throwing the, the kids are going to be throwing the rocks are going to think twice because they can see that that house is there, you know, and it can look through. Actually, yes, I did get those um, pictures of the signs you were talking about, so, and I've actually discussed it. Some of these issues aren't just school issues, yeah. they're um, DPW, that's why I've asked our DPW commissioner, Larry Rowley, yeah, to come up and answer them. So okay. to come up and answer them, some, some of them right. for you. And then okay. the yeah. next thing is they never clean the drains. The, I got pictures of it. The drains are always covered with debris and leaves. And it's been twice that I know of that that uh, gymnasium has gone underwater, which has cost the city thousands of dollars thousands and thousands of dollars, which us taxpayers have to pay for, because they don't, the custodians do not keep the, the debris off the uh, catch basins. Yeah, well, if, if you want to send me a copy of those pictures, yeah, I'll be happy I can to forward those. To and, then the, and then the biggest thing is, those dumpsters are wide open, the gates are wide open, the, the covers are wide open. I can see from my house on weekends, trucks pulling up to them, dumping all their stuff out of their trucks into, into your dumpsters, the job the city's paying them to clean up. One, I think it was last October or November last year, every night I went over for eight days in a row, and I closed the covers, and I shut the gates, and I actually fixed the gates because they wouldn't work at one time. So I spent the half a day of Saturday realigning the, the gates so they would actually shut. And then I was walking down going to get the bus, and one of the custodians says, hey, you've been closing those covers and shutting those gates. He says, I want you to leave them alone. He says, that's none of your business. And then everybody else in the city has to have their dumps this enclosed, enclosed, and, and they why, not, why not the school? And, and, and they should, and, and I think we've talked about this before, um, Bill, right, correct? Right. Right, 
So we've, we've talked about this before, and I continue to work with Mike Thomas. Yeah, but nobody sure does that, anything. But we get that. I talked to Mike Thomas about it, and he says, oh, I'm going to send them a, a memorandum or something. That was last year. That was last year? Yeah. What good did that do? They, they don't close them. Well, I can continue to carp on Mike Thomas. He's usually pretty good. And Ken Thompson in the department and make sure that we get those things closed. Because you're right, those, those areas should be closed to um, people that have that aren't supposed to have access. Right. To, I mean, uh, at one for, time. For safety reasons alone. Last fall, the whole thing was filled with roofing material that some, someone tore out their roof or something and replaced it. Took all their roofing material, filled that whole dumpster completely with roofing material. Uh, we could probably talk to Mr. Rowley, too, about ways that we might be able to block that off or, or, or can we put some sort of cameras or something in that area? To, well, it, you know, shut the shut the covers and lock the gate at night when you when you you know when they leave. I'm also concerned about them snapping the, the locks too. I don't want anybody to have access to that. Yeah, but the thing is, you know, I mean, this is a quick thing. You know, they pull up and they dump it. If they can't do it quick, yeah, but they're not going to do it. Dumping's illegal, so we don't want to yeah. make sure that they have even that opportunity. Yeah, you know, I mean, the ones that dump bigger stuff go up into the back parking lot and throw it off at the end of the back parking lot and all the briars in. Yeah. And I dig all that stuff out. Oh, I know. You do a heck of a job. <laughs> I'll tell you, you do a heck of a job cleaning that area. I mean, that area is really nice and clean. I love it. The kids love it, too. I was over there just a couple weeks ago cleaning up with the kids with the softball field. And, and it's, you know, you, you do help a tremendous amount. Thank you for that. But yeah, that's something that we could definitely get addressed that we can look and see with our school department. Yeah, I'd like to see that else. back packing lot with a gate across it. You don't have to lock it, yeah. but have a swinging gate that's shut. So when the ball players come on the weekend, they can just open it up and go in. But if the gates, because there's a lot of uh, stuff that shouldn't be going on over there. I mean, every morning when I clean the park, if there's not that much in the park, I go into the back parking lot of the school and clean all that up. It's filled with condoms every morning that these kids are gonna walk across. You know? Uh, we can we can certainly look at addressing that situation <laughs> that that's not a good environment for children either. No. But uh, I don't know if Mr. Rowley you wanna say anything on that? On the signs maybe. Hello everybody, thank you for coming. Um, to answer your question on the signs, we are addressing that with Mass DOT. The mayor has an advisory board. He is working, um, we are working very hard with the state. We are gonna get some state money. We're gonna do like you suggested, great idea, with the solar powered signs, or right. whatever we have to do. I agree, the signs that we're putting out there now, the people are just hitting them and running them over. So give us a little bit longer to get this going, and, and we're gonna have a good uh, program. Yeah, for, all the, for all the schools. It's got to be a lot cheaper a lot than putting a light across in the middle of a, you know, blinking yellow light across the street that's on power. I mean, it's got to be right, cheaper right. than that. Right, Everything's like solar powered now. So that's yeah. the way, we, that's what we're looking into. And, and the mayor is very, very um, proud of this pedestrian safety committee that she said, and I'm, and I'm on it, and I'm proud of it too, because we want everybody to be safe. So we are addressing that. Yeah, and I think the one big problem with this school in the Raymond schools, you got your cross here, but then down the street there's the next one, down by the um, shopping plaza, there's a crossing from the Raymond school. So you got two. So they might stop here, but then they go flying and you're trying to go across to the shopping plaza, you know, and nobody stops at that cross, you know. This has all been addressed with the traffic commission also. And we're well aware of what's going on out there. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bill, for those questions. And thank you, Ray and Larry, for answering them. Um, if you have any, if anybody in the audience, I did get some questions in between, and we'll read them at the end. I do have a few people that are going to just present some of their programs. The next person is um, Mr. Brian Moriarty. He's from NeighborWorks. So welcome, Brian. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Brian Moriarty. I'm the director of uh, 
Brockton office of Naval Works on the Mass, and I'd like to thank Councilor Azak for her invitation tonight. Uh, just give you a quick uh, background of Naval Works. Naval Works is a congressionally chartered nonprofit. Uh, we get our money and we report directly to Congress for our uh, services. We came to Brockton in 2008 mainly to, to do first-time home buyer education. But Brockton was in the midst of the foreclosure crisis. So that kind of took over our, our emphasis. And since 2008, we've seen uh, over 2,500 people in foreclosure counseling. About half of those have been Brockton residents. Brockton has been number one in foreclosure in the state for uh, several years. So Brockton, um, was the uh, focal point for subprime mortgages. And uh, so we came in, act as a advocate for homeowners in working with their lenders to uh, see if they can get uh, um, loan modifications. Uh, we've been able to help about 500 people stay in their homes uh, through uh, loan modifications. Uh, the other thing that we do that's very important is first time home buyer education. There's a correlation, there was a study done by uh, HUD, by the Urban Institute that says, if you receive first time home buyer education, you're much less likely to be foreclosed on. Uh, a lot of these people that we see in foreclosure counseling never had this type of education and it's critical uh, because they uh, were duped into getting mortgages that they weren't qualified for didn't understand the product, and uh, years later after a, a reset, because a lot of them were teaser type of rates, uh, later they found out, well, I, I can't afford this, and I never really could. So uh, first time home buyer is critical. Along with the first time home buyer education uh, is the uh, down payment assistance program. Mayor Carpenter, uh, through the Brockton Redevelopment Authority, has designated $165,000 for down payment assistance. If you're a first-time home buyer, uh, first-time home buyer, you take the, the first-time home buyer education class. You're eligible to get $7,500 from the city and an additional $2,500 from NeighborWorks for a total of uh, $10,000 to buy your first home. We think that's really important. Uh, we want to get uh, first-time home buyers in. Uh, in these homes uh, to raise property values, to get new families, to re revitalize neighborhoods. So I've got uh, a pamphlet and some brochures. I'm sitting over here and I'll uh, walk around and uh, hand them out. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. No? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and I hope everybody will take advantage of the program. It's really a great program. Um, next, we have uh, Mr. Paul Chouinard, who's going to talk to us about Bike to Work. Hello, uh, I'm Paul Chouinard, as I was say. Uh, one of your um, transportation planners at the Old Colony Planning Council. Um, I work on a number of different uh, transportation projects, anywhere from uh, doing service and route planning for the Brockton Area Transit Authority to uh, bike and pedestrian safety, as well as um, infrastructure planning as well. So I run the gamut of things I do. Um, one of the events that we're co-sponsoring this year is the um, Bike to Work event. It's the second annual, Brockton had one last year in front of the Bat Center. Uh, we had a pretty good turnout. Uh, we're doing it again this year. Uh, we're partnering with the Brockton Area Transit Authority, Mass Dot, Mass Bike, and a host of other organizations to bring this to you. So. Um, I highly encourage you to stop on by, ride on by. Um, it'll be in front of the Bath Center so you can't miss it. It's going to be from the hours of 7 in the morning to 8.30. And the reason why we're having so early is that people can get to work after they ride down there. And um, I encourage you to come. Yeah. It's going to be uh, May 15th from 7 a.m. to 8.30 in front of the Bath Center. There'll be coffee and uh, small snacks for those who come. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and I hope everybody rides a bike to work that day. <laughs> um, next, I'm going to have Ms. Lynn Smith talk to you a little bit about um, what she's doing. 
Uh, I have to speak from the hot. Lynn actually, um, I've gotten to know her in the past year or so, and she's developed the neighborhood associations. Um, she's actually developed one here on Ward 7, which is um, Shore. And um, I think it's a great thing. If anybody's interested in developing a neighborhood association in uh, Ward 7, I'd like you to contact me or Lynn, and we would love to get that going. It's really, it's, it brings back that old neighborhood feel. So um, I'm going to have her talk to you a little bit. Okay. Thanks. Oops. You okay? You too. Great. Go on. Thanks. So thanks, everyone, for coming out tonight. Neighborhood associations are nothing new. I'm sure all of us remember them from our younger days. What we try to do is just get folks in the neighborhood to come out to events and get to know each other. So this spring, for example, my Keith Park Neighborhood Association down in Campello had 97 families come out with their kids for an Easter egg hunt. We also had a community dining out night where we just picked a restaurant in the ward and we brought our own tables umbrellas and outdoor chairs and we set up a pop-up cafe and we just got to know each other around the table for dinner. Um, we have a couple of events going on right now. If any of you go into downtown Brockton, you'll see four brand new little free libraries. A little free library is a brightly decorated box about three feet off the ground that's stocked with books, and it's a very simple concept. Take one, leave one, it's free. So on the spur of the moment, as you walk by, you open up the little door, you look in, if there's a book that looks interesting, you take it home and you read it, and then maybe you have a book at home that you've read and you wanna share. So it was a wonderful cooperative effort. Mark Lindy, uh, who is the representative to Southeastern Regional VOTEC, introduced me to the crew at the school and those young men and women as part of their community service project made the little free libraries. We had four different nonprofits decorate them. One of them was decorated by the um, family center. The little kids rolled paint on their hands <laughs> and then stuck their hands all over the little free library. The one that's in the park next to the Boys and Girls Club on Warren is decorated with boxing memorabilia. The one that's in Finnegan Park next to the telephone building and the um, school headquarters across from the new Family Resource Center um, is decorated, that's the little hands one. And then the Four Seasons one is gonna be put in City Hall um, Plaza pretty soon. So Bob Buckley this week came to the official unveiling and put the first honorary book in the Little Free Library, but this is the type of thing we do with our neighborhood associations. The other thing we did last year in Keith Park Campello is a local real estate company called Equity Realty Plus sponsored the rental of one of those giant outdoor inflatable screens. They come and they bring this thing and they blow it up like a giant balloon in the Macy's Day Parade, and it's a 16-foot outdoor movie theater screen. And we showed E.T. under the stars. So all the kids came, laid on blankets, had free popcorn, and watched E.T. It was fabulous. So it was so much fun that Equity Realty Plus is gonna do six of them this year for us. So three Fridays in July and three Fridays in August. July 17 at Edgar Park, the 24th at Downey Field, the 31st at Tukas, August 7th in City Hall Plaza, because Mr. Buckley said it will be done by then. <laughs> August 14th in Keith that Park and Campello, I know. <laughs> and then August 21st, you know the new little playground that's going in on Mulberry Street? Mulberry runs in between East Ashland and Elliott, so we'll have one there. So if you're on social media or if you're on Facebook, you can go on Facebook. We're letting people vote for the movies that they want to see. So each week we give the, you three choices. So for example, in Edgar Park, the three choices are cool runnings about the Jamaican bobsled team, um, one about a football team on, this, on the shoulders of giants, I think, and the third one is Rocky. Why not Rocky across the street from where Rocky Marciano grew up, uh, right? So we have the little free libraries, we have the uh, Friday Night Flicks and my Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association 
just got a $10,000 grant from Mass Humanities to host a community conversation in the fall about freedom fighters from all of our cultures. So not just Frederick Douglass, not just Martin Luther King, but people like Susan B. Anthony, Daniel O'Connell, Amalka Cabral, um, Toussaint Louverture, and we're gonna talk about those figures and what they mean to justice, and then historic signs are gonna go into the park downtown. So if you're interested, Shirley has been wonderful. She's come to every one of our Shore neighborhood meetings. Shore stands for Sawtucket, Herod, Orchard, and Rutland. And so I'm sure we'll be having another one. We'll be having a cookout um, this year. So if you're interested, contact Shirley, contact me. And then remember, in July and August, come on out and enjoy the movie. We'll have plenty of adults there helping out. Our Brockton community police are gonna come and meet the kids. We'll be giving out popcorn and prizes, so it should be a good time. So thanks very much for your attention. Thanks. Thank you, Lynn. Um, before we go on to our next uh, person that's going to present a little for us, I do want to recognize Mr. Bob Buckley, our chief of staff. He's in the audience. And he, he is here to represent the mayor who couldn't be here this evening due to the fact that there's another meeting going on at public safety, I believe, with the school department. So um, thank you for being here, Bob. Well, thank you for having me. And I know I've taken a few questions. I do want to bring something up um, that's been put out there. It's on the uh, city website. It's called C Click Fix. And um, this is, it's, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but if you're not, it's, um, it's a really great asset. You just go on to the, uh, any issues that you have. I know a few questions that did come up were problems with street lights, uh, vandalism, or um, graffiti, abandoned properties. I mean, the list goes on, but these are things that can be taken care of if you sign on to see Click Fix on, to, on the main uh, website screen for um, the city of Brockton. And you can fill in the information and um, it'll, it gets taken care of because there's actually a, a trail. I don't want to call it a paper trail, it's a web trail. So be, it's going to the correct department, it's being taken care of by the city um, departments that need to take care of that issue. Um, so I hope people will take advantage of that. It really is a a great thing. Next I have um, Ms. Ann Beauregard who's going to tell you about some great things going on in the in Ward 7 and around Brockton. She does a great job at that. So, The first thing, thank you, Councilor Rezia. Okay, the first thing is uh, Paul talked about Bike to work, to work Day, but on Saturday in DW Field Park is Bike Safety um, the uh, Stephanie Danielson is organizing that. It's about her fourth year doing this, and there'll be a. Oh, Edgar's. I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting me. It's at Edgar's this year. I'm sorry. I was getting mixed up with the kids' road races at DW Field Park. So there's plenty of time to exercise and plenty of time to get good things. And again, these events are free, and they're both taking place. What the Edgar Playground Bike Safety is um, from 10 to uh, 20 to 12. And the kids' road races, uh, the registration starts at 9.30. Um, let's see here. Oh, the following week, we have our plant sale, annual uh, plant sale with the Garden Club. All the proceeds go to gardening throughout the city of Broughton because Keep Broughton Beautiful Day is every day. And um, this, this event is huge. Get there early. It starts at 8 o'clock. It's at the Parks and Recreation Department, 45 Meadow Lane. And uh, get there before it starts at 8.30 because it's packed, the deals are incredible, and everything pretty much goes by 11 o'clock. So I uh, highly recommend this. I'll leave some flyers. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and the last thing is because uh, somebody else was talking about books and uh, libraries, etc. cetera. Broughton uh, Public Library has a whole lot of great events going on the month of uh, May. One of them is going to be the art exhibit from the public school teachers and that's at the Driscoll Art Gallery on May 27th, 3 to 5 is the reception, that's free to the public, but not only that, the art's up for a good month. Meanwhile, it's Mother's Day in the month of May, and um, our mother's, mother's stories uh, will be held on Saturday, May 23rd, beginning at 2 p.m. This is a free event with Dr. Pilgrim. She's a professor over at uh, UMass Boston in Africana Studies. And people are welcome to tell their stories, and she's going to share other stories and 
It's going to be a nice social event and uh, light refreshments, etc. And I've only dented all the great things that will be going on in uh, May and June. And uh, last, um, Councilor Azak wants me to mention that the um, Fuller Craft Museum is going to be holding Craft and Bloom the 5th, 6th, and 7th of June. And uh, this is a marvelous event. And uh, First of its kind, actually, because there's only two craft museums on the east coast of this country, and one of them's in Brockton, the other one's in Manhattan. So uh, there'll be a lot more information posted on that, and Council ASAP will be running a workshop so you can learn how to do um, floral design, and it's just one of the many good things that have been going on. So. Thank you, Ann. I'd also like to recognize um, Mr. Gary Leonard, who's in the audience. Um, Mr. Gary Leonard is our downtown manager. Main Street manager. Main Street manager. And um, as you all know, downtown, the Main Street is under construction. So he told me that's all he has to say. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please write them down, or afterwards we'll, we'll ask them. But I did want to recognize that he's here. So thank you for being here, Gary. Thank you. And if and has a cure for allergies, that helps out. Sure, that, that's next meeting. Um, also, um, my co-host tonight, uh, Councilor Shana Barnes is here, so um, she she's going to present something to you, uh, just a little what's going on at, at I believe, Fuller Craft Museum also. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Excuse my tardiness. I have been running all day. But I did want to uh, share with specifically the Ward 7 residents and all of the residents of Brock, and I went over to the Fuller Craft Museum today and I spoke with uh, Titi and she wanted me to share that they will be having a South Shore Indie Music Festival on June 13th. And there are gonna be two specific artists that are gonna be there, Shay Rose and Sadie Veda. And um, she wanted me to make sure that everyone is, is aware of that. Also, it's going to be hosted by Charlie Zenchild Paul. And apparently, she has some connection with Brockton. I've not uh, ever met her, but apparently she does have some connection here in Brockton. She moved, recently moved to New York to do uh, some of her spoken word and her poetry. But she will be coming back here to host this event. And apparently, she's full of energy, full of life, and she's really excited about this music uh, festival. Also, the tickets are $25, but they do have some discounted tickets available for students, for members, and all of those kinds of things. So uh, there are several flyers over here on this table. I'll leave them there for you to, uh, to look at at your leisure. And um, we would love to have you attend that um, really good cultured uh, event at the Fuller Craft. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councilor Barnes. And um, as, a, as I mentioned at the beginning, for people who asked, this, isn't, this is not this wasn't planned to be a casino meeting, but I did, um, as you all know, next Tuesday, May 14th, or May 12th, May 12th, next Tuesday, um, polls open at 8 a.m., and um, I hope everybody goes out to vote. We need people to go out and make an, um, you know, an educated vote. So tonight I decided, I invited um, people from the group that's uh, with the casino, Mr. Larry Curtis, so I'm going to have him come up here, kind of do his presentation, and then take some questions. But once again, this isn't a casino meeting. It's really to answer your questions. This is for people who still have questions that are unanswered. And um, I understand I'm, there's no way we could all get our questions answered in such a short period of time. But it's good to go in there, go into the polls with a, you know, with a good feeling, knowing how you're going to vote. So, Mr. Larry Curtis. Um, my name's Larry Curtis. I'm a resident for the last 18 years and a homeowner here in the city of Brockton. And I am the field director for Yes for Brockton. So the purpose of my being here this evening is to answer to the best of my ability uh, any questions you may have related to the uh, resort destination casino that if you recall back in February, the city of Brockton entered into a host agreement with a developer called Rush Street Gaming to site a uh, destination resort casino on the Brockton Fairgrounds. A series of events took place shortly after that uh, agreement was entered into in mid-February, where our finance committee and then our city council basically had a public hearing and agreed 
that the election, a special election, which is required by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts mass gaming laws, be held on Tuesday, May 12th. From the date that the city council confirmed that to this coming Tuesday, it's been a nine-week roller coaster ride for everybody here in the city. So um, we have seen over the last eight and a half weeks a series of emotions, a roller coaster ride, as I like to call it, where you may have social questions, you may have moral questions, you may have economic development questions, all of which are important to you as a voter when you go to the polls this coming Tuesday to cast a, a vote as to whether the city of Brockton will support or will not support a destination casino on the Brockton fairgrounds. I'm not here to, to debate those personal emotions that you may have socially, morally, or economically. I'm here to try to answer any questions you have as, as it relates to the development specifically uh, because what we found over the last eight and a half weeks is that there were really about three or four primary issues. It was the proximity to the high school, it was the traffic concerns, it was the question of property values, and the all-important question of public safety and security for the city of Brockton. So those four issues really are what were prominent that we've seen, and there have been a series of meetings over the last several weeks that have attempted to address those. Those meetings were held both for a organization that is against the casino, they were held for the organization being yes for Brockton that is supportive of the casino. So again, I'm not here to debate the, the personal, social, moral, or economic uh, pieces you have because I'm a believer that when we go into the polls on Tuesday, we're gonna pull that curtain behind us. We're gonna take our social, we're gonna take our moral, and we're gonna take our economic development information that we've been able to gather over the last eight weeks, and we're going to cast a vote for either yes or no. And yes, I am voting yes, I'll tell you that, because I believe it's the right thing for the city to move forward on. So with that being said, I'll step back, I'll try to answer any questions, uh, specifically as they relate to the, tr to the traffic concerns, because that has been really the number one issue that has been out there over the last several weeks. Thank you. Any questions? When you say infrastructure, could you be a little more specific? Roads, All right, roads. roads. Okay. Avenue, All right. First, let me refer anybody to the city website, www.cityofbrockton.com. There is a traffic impact study that is now on the city website. It is also on the website for Yes for Brockton, www.yesforbrockton.com as well. That traffic study, in layman's terms, if I can kind of summarize it for you, basically says that currently the Mass Department of Transportation, in conjunction with Old Colony Planning Council, have already identified a six and a half million dollar infrastructure improvement plan starting at Manley Street and heading up to West Street on Belmont, heading up Belmont to West Street. Those improvements will consist of a combination of turnouts so that buses do not stop in the right travel lane and, and, and stop traffic, turnouts so that you'd be able to turn left into some of the, the malls that are there. Uh, in addition to that, there will be a replacement of all the lights that are currently, uh, you have Manly Street. Uh, from Manly Street, you then you go to the VA. From the VA, you then go up to West Street. There was going to be an additional uh, traffic light and, and, and crossing put at Linwood Street as well because that's an area that doesn't have one right now. And those traffic lights will be updated and modernized to the point that, you know, uh, pedestrians will be able to hit the traffic light, and bring traffic to a stop, allow somebody to safely cross. There'll be time uh, as, they, as you see in some of the other cities and towns out there. So those improvements are currently on the drawing board, they have been approved, the six and a half million dollars is in place for that to begin, and it will probably begin sometime in the next year, it will probably take a, a little bit of a year or so to, to complete those. As it relates to the development proposal that we're talking about, Rush Street Gaming in its host agreement has agreed to su support 
an eight and a half million dollar infrastructure to improve from West Street up to up Belmont Street to Torrey Street, doing a similar type of, of infrastructure improvements to the sidewalks, the turnouts, and adding the additional lights to support the flow of traffic. It is also, if you take a right on West Street from Belmont, where you come up to what I call the triangle, the three-stop triangle in front of the library, that triangle is basically been recommended to be removed and what they call a roundabout put in so that traffic flow can come into and out of that area much more smoothly without having to stop from three ways in the stop sign. And at that point also, you will see a widening of um, Forest Avenue from two lanes to four lanes that will accommodate the traffic not only supporting uh, the commercial business along the library, the registry of motor vehicles, up past the, uh, the high school entrance and around toward Thurber, but it will also be one of the uh, ways in which an entrance into the, the uh, gaming resort would be taken would be, be taking place down about in front of the registry of motor vehicles. In addition to that, there will be additional uh, lights, uh, traffic lights that will be put in place so that the safety of the pedestrians will be taken into consideration as well from that perspective there. If you continue around the roundabout and heading back up west toward Belmont, the same thing's happening on there. There is no imminent domain land being taken. The additional length and that area will all come off of the fairgrounds property, not on the commercial side of the property there. So when it is all said and done, you will have new roads, new, new crosswalks, new lights uh, from Manly Street all the way up to Torrey, and then uh, uh, double the widening of West Street from, from that perspective there. That's the design, eight and a half million dollars from the developer in conjunction with the six and a half million dollars that the State Mass Department of Transportation has already earmarked for a 15 million dollar improvement, which upon uh, approval of a license would be completed within three years of time. Well, again, the traffic survey is the, to, the, to the traffic recommendation. These recommendations have been done by a 25-year traffic consultant from MDM uh, traffic consultants, and these are the recommendations that the professionals have put forward. In the case here, they're looking at it from the standpoint, from my point of view, is that you have traffic that will be coming into and out of the entrance of a casino entrance, in addition to the uh, the school traffic during the uh, you know start and end of the school day. Uh, and basically, it'll be much better controlled and flow with the addition of the lights that are put in on, on there as well. of the consultants of right. well I again that you're yeah, asking me to debate a merit that I that again I'm just sharing information sir. Right. And then the question about the school. The school is right there. You're gonna have the kids go right from school into the stop gambling and doing all this stuff. It's across the street. Sir if you believe that a student is going to leave the high school, walk onto a, a, a controlled secured premises under the age of 21 and start gambling, um, I'm not going to believe that from my point of view, sir. That's not going to happen. Not gamble, not the security of the uh, Destination Resort Casino will be threefold from the perspective of the, the casino security itself, not only internally within the premises, but externally within the parking areas. It has to be supported by the Massachusetts State Police, as is required by the Mass Gaming 
laws in addition to the, uh, the perimeter out of the uh, Brockton Police Department that would be maybe details or anything of that nature. Same location where there's a triangle now, sir. Yeah. What don't people understand? Like you have a problem down in Middleborough that they've been trying to correct for, for 25 years, and, and a much larger one down the Sagamore Bridge for 50 years now. Those are rotaries in the context of the size of the diameter of the uh, circle in the rotary and the speed at which traffic enters into a rotary. A roundabout is a proven uh, concept that the Mass Department of Transportation is now looking at and, and advising the given consideration to versus stoplights. And it has been proven to be effective because the traffic flow into a roundabout is usually about 25 miles an hour as they enter the roundabout to make the turns, where at a rotary that you mentioned, the two rotors you mentioned, you're entering those at 40, 50, 60 miles an hour, sir. It's two different concepts totally that the that the uh, Mass Department of Transportation agrees. Rotaries are not the way to go. The roundabouts are the future of, of what's happening, sir. If you believe the Ma Mass Department of Transportation, how great a study did they do at uh, Western Pleasant not very well, sir. Yeah, no. yes, sir. Right. And, and that supposedly is one of your thoroughfares to, to get to the fairgrounds. Uh, how are you going to widen that thing? Uh, you know, a no-brainer. Nobody can convince me that you're going to be able to, to come down Riddles Highway and come across and, and go into West Street if you've got the, the problem now where you've got two lanes that there or 30 feet, so to speak. No. I, I, I can't debate that. We all know that that's one of the most dangerous intersections in the city, sir. We, I agree with you 100% there. It's just ridiculous. I, I'm just wondering, how high are these uh, buildings going to be? The height of the building, you see that in, in the artist's rendition, you're looking at a 225-room hotel that will be no more than about seven stories high at the front and it will be complemented at the back of the uh, parking garage, which is estimated to be about three stories high. Right. Okay, Tim. Tim? Yeah, my question was about the jobs. I had heard a couple of rumors that uh, 2,000 jobs, and then I heard 150 jobs, and then I'm here, it's just construction jobs for people coming out of Boston. Can you enlighten us about it, that? Within the host agreement, it's been identified that upon approval of the licensing to Mass Gaming Entertainment LLC, that it will, the economic opportunity will begin with 1,400 construction jobs, union construction jobs with preferential hiring to city employees. Upon completion of the uh, development, it will then result in the creation of 1,500 permanent full-time jobs that will, again, pay on average of about $50,000 with benefits and that those jobs will have preferential hiring to uh, city employees, city residents as well. So those are the, those are the two job numbers that, that have been identified within the host agreement. And the host agreement is available online at, uh, on, the, on the city's uh, website, uh, www.citybrockton.com. Lynn? Oh, hi. I have, I have um, two questions, one on the job um, situation. Uh, I understand that people who work in the casino need to apply for a license through the Commonwealth. They need to pass a quarry check, they need to pass a credit check, and the fee to get your license is anywhere from $75 to $1,000, depending on the level of responsibility that you have in the casino. So it might be a challenge for some of our residents uh, to be able to pass all of those uh, hoops. The second thing is, do you know if uh, Rest Street, I know they were very insistent on the construction jobs being uh, union. Are they going to sign the neutrality agreement to allow the casino workers to unionize? Because they've blocked that in a couple of other cities, and I just wondered if there's been any discussion about, about that going forward. Let me take the second part of your question first. I believe it was uh, identified at the meeting at West Junior High 
uh, by the CEO, David Patton, that they welcome any of whatever their employees want to do, so that if there was an opportunity that the union was to be asked in and a vote would be taken, they, they would allow the employees to do that. Okay. So they're going to avoid the problems they've had in other cities with the national I'm not here to debate those issues, ma'am. Okay, I answered your question. What was the uh, first right. part of the question, right. please? And then the last thing, Larry, is I'm kind of of the age that I remember that there used to be ladies' nights and two-for-one drinks. <laughs> and then the Massachusetts uh, community said, too dangerous, stop it. We can't do that anymore. I think under this law, Chapter 194, the casino is allowed to serve free drinks from 8 o'clock in the morning until 3 o'clock in the morning on the gaming floor. And I know when you read the Spectrum Gaming Commission report about what happened around Foxwoods, the increase in DUI was very significant. And I just wondered, with alcohol being available for free, is that something we need to be worried about in terms of increased traffic accidents and DUI. It's the same worry we have at no other of our establishments across the city. But All of our establishments are under those same same issues. If they open up early in the morning, they stay open late at night, they're serving their patrons, they have just as much a responsibility as the gaming gaming uh, group would have. Probably our gaming people would be far more concerned about the consumption of alcohol above and beyond. Every, every liquor license out there has to be scrutinized to make sure that they're not serving somebody that could be deemed intoxicated and get into a vehicle and go home. Right. So it applies to all liquor establishments. It doesn't just apply to a casino. But, but the other establishments aren't giving the liquor away for free. They have nothing They're still under the same law. They got a liquor license that they have to abide by. That would be my answer to the question, okay? So, I mean, again, the, the patrons themselves also have to take responsibility for themselves as well. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions? Sure, regarding questions the, for me, I'm going to take questions. Any more for oh, Larry? Uh, for Larry? Okay. Yes, yeah. Uh, I, I've heard some of these other casinos up back. The two largest in the country here are Foxwoods and Bohegan Sun. Now, they have gone from contributing more than 400 million to the state of Connecticut to roughly 250 million. So there's a big slide there. But also, uh, they are, they're cutting, uh, some of them are cutting jobs and making it half time and no benefit. Free enterprise is an interesting thing, isn't it? Because Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun enjoyed a very fantastic 20-year run out there, and they escalated their earnings, you know, very, very well. And as we've seen, states surrounding, you know, Connecticut decided that they were on it to tap into some of those resources that Connecticut was enjoying, and thus competition comes into play. You know, so it's not only Foxwoods, it's not only Mohegan Sun, We've seen Atlantic City happen with closings over there. So the reality is, is that competition, free enterprise, is creating. The reality is, is that uh, Rush Street Gaming is making a $650 million investment in the city of Brockton because it has done its homework and it recognizes that the geographics of southeastern Massachusetts is can support a development of this magnitude and continue to support it going forward in the future. Any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you for the opportunity. Well, Personally, knowledgeable of any studies specifically, but if you 
look at it from a realistic point of view, uh, part of what is also within the host agreement is that vendors who supply services uh, that would be required by the Destination Resort Casino and they do business here in the city of Brockton will have preferential uh, you know, rights to, to bid and be, be considered for those services up front. They just have to be competitive, basically, as you are in a free market. Secondly, if you take those 1,500 jobs that we talked about, and let's just say 75% of those jobs went to residents of the city of Brockton, that's 1,125 jobs. Take those 1,125 jobs, take that average $50,000 a year salary, let's take 25% of that salary off as part of the fringe benefit, that leaves $37,500. $37,500 times 1,125 jobs is gonna generate $42 million of revenue into this city for our residents who will be spending that money here and probably being able to sustain a improved style of life than might be happening today for some of them. So economic impact, absolutely positively, to the tune of you know $42 million in salaries alone, just at 75% of the residents being employed for the, for the 1,500 jobs. But yes, I believe absolutely it will have an economic impact. Yeah. Anything else? I'd like to thank Council of ASAC for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. And um, I hope everybody goes out next Tuesday, May 12th. Um, polls open early and they stay open until 8 p.m. And I hope everybody goes out and votes. And um, that's all we can ask for. Whatever's best for the city is what I hope happens. So thank you again, Larry. Um, Let's see, I'm gonna take some of the, we had some questions written down, so I'm going to uh, read those and then answer them and then take some questions from the audience. If any have, if any questions are direct towards Ward 7. Let's see, we have, first off, we have street, street lighters out at Peyton, six to seven weeks to replace. National Grid told me it was now owned by the city. Can the light be replaced any sooner? Um, first off, I had mentioned earlier, I'm not sure whose question this is, but I had mentioned earlier about C Click Fix, which is on the um, city website. So if you don't want to call, you, normally I would get calls like these and I would take care of them. I would call down to the DPW and if it, the DPW gets, they've been pretty quick about changing the light bulbs or uh, the bulbs or um, you know replacing them. But if um, you don't want to call your city council, you can go directly on the website and um, fill out the information on C-Click Fix. But I will take care of this matter. I'll follow up with it. There are, um, the city does own some poles. It's, some are owned by National Grid, some by the telephone company. It's a, it's a, it's a process, but we're trying to get them, uh, you know, we're trying to get things done a lot quicker. So I think the sooner you contact somebody in the city, the quicker it will get done. So I, my number is on the uh, city website, so I can answer my phone, call me, and if I don't answer, leave me a message. I do call you back, and I do have to admit, I have had a few people call me and not leave me a name or a phone number, so it was hard to call them back. But um, I do get my messages, and I, I try my best to get things done, so um, I, hope, I look forward to hearing from you. So the next um, question is, what is Brockton's expected revenues for fiscal year 2015? I don't have the exact figure with me right now, but um, I know that we're, we're working, the mayor's working on the budget and the city council will receive it sometime close to this, um, this past, um, I'm sorry, that we will receive it at the end of this month. And we will have a, about a week or so to review it and as anything, the uh, sessions of the city council will be public, they will be televised, so you will, you will see that. So but I do apologize, I don't have an exact figure and I won't, I can't give one out. So thank you. Um, let's see, this one was a casino question that was already answered. I think it was asked directly to Larry. Next question, what do you think of the proposed 30% water rate hike? The city continues to pay Aquaria 6.5 million per year for something we don't use. Let's walk away from this fiasco Aquaria Aquaria has violated their end of the contract on several occasions, the most recent being the CFO not telling the city council um, the truth, okay. Um, let's see, about the amount of water pump during a 30-day test period. 
I can't read the rest of it, but um, I, it has been addressed. We've, we've discussed it. It's been on, if you follow our finance meetings, I think it has been addressed. We've invited Aquaria in front of uh, the city council numerous times, and when they do show up, they either don't have the information or they, you know, we're, we're trying. I know my fellow counselors have been a little, um, you know, we've been a little frustrated. We're doing our best to get them in front of us and to get your questions answered, but my, um, Councilor Barnes would like to speak on this also. Actually, just to piggyback, not to, not to cut in, but um, just recently, that 30% came before the council, but the CFO, Mr. Condon, actually presented an, uh, an amendment to the 30%, the way that the Water Commission had uh, originally presented. So they're, they're, it's actually kind of being tweaked a little bit so that it, it may not be as abrupt as the original uh, presentation, but what you know. So uh, if I were, I would just suggest that the residents continue to watch and to attend the meetings because there have been some amendments that have been presented that, are, that he's still working on some numbers to make it more palatable uh, for the, the residents of Brockton. So just be on the lookout for that. Thank you, Councilor Barnes, and that is true. We have not voted on it. It was just presented to us, and it, it, it wasn't voted on. We didn't pass it, so it's still in the works. So that's um, as of right now. So. Let's see, and that's it for the questions on the cards. Does anybody have questions for me? Yes. Yeah, well, you've seen on the news the last couple of days where a tree fell in a park, I think it was in uh, Arlington, and uh, injured quite a few uh, kids in the park. It's I been on seen. all the different TV well, stations. Well, I got three trees here that are in Walker's playground, and they overhang where the buses pick up the students at the Raymond School. This one here has got a limb that's just hanging there in midair. You can come down anytime on one of the buses. And then this is a dead tree and this is a dead tree here. All three of them are in the park right against the fence next to uh, the Raymond School parking lot where they pick and it's the the little kids that they pick up, it's not the older kids, it's the kids like in the kindergarten or first and second grade, which are not going to be paying attention to, you know, anything. And at any time, any of these three could... Uh, well, thank you for bringing that to our attention. I, you take very good care of Walker Playground. Um, but I will, as with everything else that you brought to us, Ms. Ackbom, we I will take this to the... Um, Mr. Car uh, Tim Carpenter at the Parks Department, and I'm sure his team will take care of it. And and I, have, I have one more question. Now, five years ago in back, they had a porta potty there for the, when the games are being played and that. But, you know, starting now, going through the baseball season. And uh, five years ago, some kids set it on fire. You wouldn't think a porta potty would burn, but those flames were 30 feet in the air. And the neighbor right there that, where the porta potty was, he saw who did it, he told the police, they had the kids arrested, they brought them to court, and I don't know what happened from then. But since then, the park department refuses to put a porta potty there. Well, my yard abuts. There's 260 feet of uh, property, my property, that abuts Walker's playground. And the rest of the playground, it's all open fence. But where my property is, there's shrubs and uh, flowering uh, trees and that. And they come right over. And my house is only 15 feet from that fence. And they come over there and they use that for the toilet. Oh, jeez. Oh, and, you know, I came down with cancer in November and I've been being treated at the cancer center up here. And, I mean, I'd like to be able to use my yard and not feel that, you know, that I'm going to get something else that's going to uh, 
Well, we're going to address that issue, and we'll talk about it afterwards after the meeting. And with everything, I always take it straight to either the parks department or if it's something that has to do with the sit anybody any city uh, department. So we'll take care of it as yeah. with everything. Yeah, every every summer, I've gone to the mayor's office. I've gone to the health department. The health department says, "Oh, there's nothing we can do about it." And I, well, it's a health issue. And they said, "Well, you have to go to the mayor's office." I go to the mayor's office. I even sent Mayor Carpenter last year an email about it. But well, we're going to work together on anything. this because it is a quality of life issue. And um, as with everything, I every issue you brought to me, and where I think we talk often. Um, I take them straight to City Hall and try to get them resolved. So we will talk about this and we'll get it taken care of. As with any other issues that anybody, um, you know, in their ward, I do stress that you call your city councilors. If the city councilor doesn't know about the issue or it's being posted on um, social media somewhere, there's no way they can know about it. You need to contact them and then, you know, give them a chance to take care of it. And that's, I, I feel very strongly about that. You need to contact your city officials. They people, we don't have ESP, you have to tell us what the problem is and then we're going to try our best to take care of it and hopefully it's something that can be taken care of. So uh, whether it's myself or any of my colleagues and we also have our at-large counselors that are there for you. So, um, you know, if it's something on Ward 7, call me and if you don't get it, you know, feel free to call Councilor Barnes, Councilor Sullivan, uh, Councilor Rodriguez, you know, you can call, um, you can call them. It's uh, you know, it's not a, I don't, that's what they're there for. Um, I, Liz, any other questions out there? Yes. Okay, what, um, earlier we had our DPW commissioner, um, Mr. Larry Rowley, who was here, and I have to say, uh, now that he's not here, he has done an amazing job. He dealt, he is, I don't know how many hats he's wearing at this point, but I think he's the head of many departments at this point. And he's take, you know, there's a few that have retired, but he's doing a really great job. And um, he approached me with, uh, I had my list of streets, and then he presented, I believe, other counselors as well with streets that need paving. Um, I drove every street in, in Ward 7, and um, there are some, we have a lot of streets that aren't that great. But I did pick a few. Um, it hasn't been approved yet because it's chapter on um, 90 money and it needs to be approved. And the mayor also approves, you know, between the um, DPW commissioner and the mayor, they approve the lists that are sent to them by the um, ward counselors. But um, I did drive them and I have to tell you, I found the worst ones um, out of the ones that I had gotten calls on, because many constituents call me, were, um, let me see, I did write them down so I don't, there's Oak Ridge Drive and Oak Ridge Drive West and East. They're all connected right off of Oak Street. They're really, they're really bad. There's also Augustine Street, Raymond Road, Berglund Ave, Fitzpatrick, Ave and Circle, Snell Street, Sophia. I mean, the list goes on. Cross Street, there's a lot of streets that are in bad condition, but there are just some that are, I mean, a lot worse than others. So. He asked for a five-year uh, plan. I gave him, you know, some the first few streets that I felt were really the worst, which were some of the ones that I just named off, and then they'll decide which ones, um, you know, they're gonna pick. There could be changes in the next, you know, five years. I'm sure, you know, depending on uh, if I'm city councilor. Or, so I don't know if you have a street in particular, but always feel free to call me and tell me, or you know, call somebody to tell them what street you want you feel needs to be paved. I did drive down Locust, yeah. okay. but I'll put it on the list. So it just, we'll see what they approved. And then like I said, there's a five year plan and they will, they haven't come back to us with what will be done. But um, there's only, if, if the process is very, um, we don't have the funds to fix all of them all at once. So it's uh, you know chapter 90 money and whatever funds come in there they determine on how much a street's going to cost. So we'll we'll see. But I put that on there. Okay. Waldo, and Waldo was on there. Yeah. Waldo, yeah. they're all. I drove them all, but like I said, yeah. some of them are a lot worse than others. But I've added them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I'm gonna take uh, yes, Tim. Put this book one second. Whose book is it? PWP. Of course, that's my. Come on up, because we were gonna do that city council. All right, um, we have uh, Tim.
Tim, Mr. Tim Sullivan here. He's going to talk a little bit about DW. Good evening. My name is Tim Sullivan. I live here in Ward 7. I've been a resident for almost 50 years now. Ian Borogard brought this to my attention. I, didn't, I just came to listen tonight. But Ian brought it up that the DW Field Park Association is selling this book. It's $15. And it's at the library right now. Is that right, Ian? It's at the Fuller Craft and the library, both. And it's selling it for $15. The DW Field Park Association has their Oktoberfest usually in the first week of October every year. And that book, this book will be for sale then. It explains everything. The, uh, all the ponds, how they used to, the kids used to swim there, what, when it was dedicated, when it became a historical site. And this book will tell you everything. And the profit of the book is going to go right back to the uh, DW Field Park Association, which handles all the cleanup, also handles uh, stock of the ponds with fish, and it's just for a good time for everybody. In DW Field Park, which is Daniel Waldo Field himself, has donated that years ago, and it's a beautiful place in Ward 7 for everybody to go bring their family and have a good time. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Ian. I know that is a great book, so I hope you all get your copies, and um, they're being sold at numerous places, and um, the profits all go to the GW Fields Association. So, very good. Um, any other questions? Yes. Did you have a question? No, just... I think Snell Street should be number one. I mean, I'll put that most. on there. It's on, I'm telling you, the list was long. Because I had a lot of streets on there. I mean, that street is it. used more than any other street well, in the world. We'll so. add them. After this, you can, we can add on there, and they can be reviewed by the um, DPW department. But we'll when talk I, about it. When I called them, they had 97 potholes this spring. Wow. We have, a, we have a lot. Our streets are in rough shape. Um, but I, I do want to mention that our... Uh, Democratic State Committee person, Jackie Bonarigo, couldn't be here this evening. She did want me to announce that the, um, even though, I, I'm not sure if Ray's still here for the Republican Party, but um, we represent everyone. It's not, you know, party affiliation, but we did want to announce that there is a caucus coming up for the Democratic um, um, State Committee. And Thank you, Councilor Barnes. Um, any other questions before we conclude? No? Very good. Well, first off, thank you everyone for being here. I'd like to thank Mr. Mark, Lindy, and his team at BCA for filming this for us. I, it really means a lot. Thank you again to the school department for letting us host it here at North uh, Middle School. And happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Thank you.